Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues. Today's a very special day because we have an extraordinarily special guest, Ambassador Michael Oren from Israel. Uh, it is a pleasure for us at our synagogue congregation, KINS, and I feel very fortunate that among our members are Stephanie Engelson Argaman, who has a very long relationship with Ambassador Oren and made this possible. Ambassador Oren has a very, very distinguished career in Jewish and Israel service, having served as the ambassador to the United States, having served as a member of Knesset, and as an author of not only historical works, but most recently, The Night Archer and Other Stories, a great book of short stories where I want to really start our conversation today. Welcome, Ambassador. Hello, Rabbi Mazaki. Shalom, shalom. <laughs> It is Delightful to be with you. Uh, thank you for thank you for giving us your time. Uh, let me start. You know, everyone when they heard I was going, to, I had the opportunity to speak with you for this afternoon. Said, "Great, ask them all about Israel. Ask them all about the Israel conflict. Ask them all about politics." And I said, first, I'm going to ask one thing. You're a writer, not only of history, a PhD from Princeton, but of short stories. You've put out already, uh, this is your fourth volume, and there's a fifth one coming out any moment, I understand, uh, to all who call in truth. It's and, right here. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> okay, I was told it's this summer. Mazel tov on the new book. L'chol yekrulo b'emet. Ah, okay. I didn't even I didn't even think of the biblical connection. You, you say you say the Ashray three times a day, right? right. <laughs> At least you say it twice in the morning, right? right. So four, four times a day you're saying Ashray, and that's what's from. Wow. So let me start from the writing piece. You you yes. in the introduction to the Night Archer. You write that at 12, you started writing poetry, and then you found yourself writing throughout your life, except when you were in public service, you couldn't publish. Because, Precisely. And these stories, there are over 50 stories in this new book. When did you write them? Like, over, was that while you were ambassador? Was that while you were Haver Knesset? Mostly when I was in the Knesset. I didn't have time when I was ambassador, I must say. That was like, you know. No, no sleep, but um, yeah, some sleep in Knesset. So yes, I started writing then. You know, under Israeli law, you can't publish if you're in public office. Um, like certain offices in the United States, you know, the president of the United States doesn't publish a memoir while while he or slash her is in the White House, uh, and neither does the Secretary of State. So it's the same thing in Israel. Um, so I had these stories. I'd get up very, very early to write them. Uh, I still get up very, very early to write to this morning. And um, and I've been, you know, people ask me, why, when did you go from writing history to writing fiction? I said, no, you've got it the other way around. I started off as a fiction writer. I started off as a short story novelist and script writer. I was surprised people by telling them that I won the, um, at 17, I won the National Young Filmmakers Contest on PBS and went on to become Orson Welles' assistant. Yeah, that there's, I, there's a new one. <laughs> that's another question I have to ask you about. Orson, about Orson Welles? <laughs> you don't want to know. You know, no, no, not not a nice human being, not a nice human being. Oh. But you know, I held his cue cards, and uh, and that was it. But I had this, you know, I was had a strong uh, Zionist Jewish upbringing, and uh, I had to move to Israel. I wasn't going to stay in Hollywood, and and miss actually the most exciting uh, drama adventure movie of all time, which is called The State of Israel. Well, you made Aliyah in 1979, if I have it correct. You yes, but I had been here quite frequently before that, starting in the summer of 1970. So I was here throughout the 1970s. And Israel back then was a was a backwater. There was nothing here. It was the Wild West. And, uh, you know, to make a call home to my parents, you had to sit and dial the international dial, dial the operator, 118. I can still see it, 118, about 100 times. It cost you a couple hundred dollars to speak for five minutes. All the time you're putting in the tokens, the asimonim, right? I, 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 st I still remember having to go to the central post office in Yerushalayim, paying in advance, waiting for your turn in a booth, and then when your money was run out, had run out, they just hung up on you. Yep, <laughs> they did. They did. They did. So it was it was a very very different country. Um, there was no food, <laughs> there were no restaurants, and it's, today when Israel is like a culinary capital of the world. You no, know, it's extraordinary. And it too, and I look out at, you know, I'm in Jaffa here, look out at Jaffa, I look at Tel Aviv and think that I had some role in making this. It's a source of great and deep um, gratification for me. And in terms of, have your stories been translated into Hebrew? No, my other books have been translated into Hebrew. Uh, not my story. It'd be very hard to translate some of these stories into Hebrew. Uh, they're very, I don't know, uh, very American, some of them, though some of the stories do take place in Israel. Um, and 
I, I, one of the failings of my life, you taught me about being so accomplished. One of my great failures is that I've never, I could never write fiction in Hebrew. I can only write fiction in English, though I write you know, Hebrew op-eds and I speak on TV or in the Knesset. It's not a language problem. It's a soul problem. The language of my soul is not Hebrew. My language of my soul is English. And after I view all, it as a failure. After all these years, are you still translating in your head or just the way your soul communicates? It's the way my soul communicates. It just communicates and it's the way it comes out. And I don't, you know, Rabbi, I don't, I don't go to these stories that come to me. And my usual reaction when a, when a, when a story comes knocking is to say, oh, no, that's, that's too out of the box. That's too strange. I, I can't possibly write that. Um, and it's always a, it's a challenge. It's, a, it's sometimes very frightening to see that empty computer page. But uh, at the end, it's very exciting to see an idea that started off way, way out in left field, to use a, an American expression. And see it come come and come sliding on home. So, out of curiosity, when you write, sometimes I've heard composers speak that they hear a tune in their head, and then they're able to start putting it to paper. Do you just sit at the blank screen and say, "Think of something," or is it something comes to you first? Also, usually it comes to me, and what I, I like to think of it as an, building a suspension bridge. The two ends of the bridge come to me, but I'm not sure how they meet in the middle. And I actually picture this. It's actually a construction. And uh, the great challenge is to get these two ends, you know, to, to, to somehow align with one another. Are they the beginning? They don't, the they don't often do that. They don't always do it. Yeah. Are they the beginning and the ending, those two ends, or are they just two strands within? Usually the beginning and the end. And, Usually the beginning and, and the end. And, and if you notice, some of the stories start off in one place and they go in a very different place. Right. Um, because I'm already thinking about the, the end of the, the end of the bridge, the other end, you know, uh, I don't and, know what a good Chicago image was, but if you're from the East coast, it's the Verrazano Narrows bridge. <laughs> we, we have short lift bridges. So it's, uh, I don't think it works the same way, <laughs> yeah. but so in the new book that you're coming out, I was able to read the night archer and all of the stories, they're different. The language is beautiful, but they're different short pieces. Is the same thing true about to all who call, call in truth. Well, I, it's, it's my philosophy of writing. Um, you know, I, I hearken back to the days of Hemingway and Fitzgerald, people who went out and did things in life. Uh, today, alas, most of the people writing, certainly in America, are teaching in English departments or creative writing departments. And so their range of life experiences are very limited. Um, many of them, you know, haven't been, for example, in the army, haven't gone to war, um, um, haven't lived in among you know, poor populations or in different countries. They haven't. And so this impacts the writing. I, I am fortunate, I don't always say I'm fortunate, to have had a very wide uh, range of experiences. And one of the levels of that is to, is to draw on those experiences in, 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 in constructing a very broad and colorful spectrum uh, of stories. I don't want to be bound to one genre. I don't want to be bound to one voice. Um, I want to explore. I talk in the introduction to that hour about writing being an act of freedom albeit it's a Jewish act of freedom, which I think we can talk about because as we come up to Shavuot, it's a Jewish concept of freedom, um, but it is that. And in, um, in To All Call and Truth, I take a, a story which at, you know, on its face looks very prosaic, I must say. Uh, the book is about a junior high school guidance counselor who was also a football coach and a basketball coach and a baseball coach. In, in his spare time, he runs a youth group at the local conservative synagogue the synagogue plays an important role in this book. And it takes place in suburban East Coast uh, town uh, in 1972. Now, does that sound boring to you or what? Well, <laughs> it sounds boring to me. But it sounds very much like your life. You were in USY and Habonim in New Jersey. In sure. New Jersey. But, 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 you know, it's like painting a very uh, bright canvas, uh, a painting on a very plain canvas. So on this plain canvas of this junior high school guidance counselor in suburban New Jersey in 1972 emerges a story, which is about uh, betrayal and love and ultimately murder. Wow. So it is, it is a novel. It's just one story as opposed to- a It is one story. It's one story. It, uh, I hope it's a quick read. But, you know, as I said, it's a very Jewish story. It has cameo appearances by Elie Wiesel, uh, Shlomo Kalibach, and America Hunt. Uh, 
they're not identified as such, but I think people, I don't know, my generation, I'm probably older than you, I'm older than everybody. People will identify them. They'll know we're talking about Ellie Wiesel, we'll know we're talking about America High. Well, it's, um, it, these personalities were people I grew up knowing and some of them meeting as well. So I'm looking forward to being able to get that book, which I assume I'll get the same way as I got this one, uh, our handy dandy Amazon. And it's Amazon uh, bookstores, uh, they all have them. They all have them. Uh, and then they're available in digital form, in audio form. I didn't do the audible, but they're available in, in audio form uh, as well. So after 120, how would you want to be known as the writer, as the ambassador, as the, how, what do you think is your, your contribution, your greatest contribution to mankind? Um, grandfather. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can I know how, how many so far? I have five and a half. <laughs> <laughs> five and a half. I'm working on it. And uh, so grandfather, that's most important. But it, it, it gives me great, great satisfaction to know that my, my grand, my kids and my grandkids, you know, feel at home in the state of Israel. They're not immigrants. They're not first generation. They're Israeli. They speak, you know, their Hebrew is different. Um, and they have, you know, no intention of leaving this country. So that, that to me is a source of great satisfaction. Um, I mentioned before my, the privilege of having worked to build this country. Um, and, you know, at the end of that line, I, I'd like to think of myself as a writer. And, um, and maybe, you know, people will read these stories, you know, after I'm gone and get a, a sense of the type of person I was. But that, that, that takes place at a very different level of consciousness and sensibility. And in terms of your involvement still in Israeli life today, Mm -hmm. For Americans, because of your ability to communicate, you are one of those voices who we look to, to hear and to read in terms of what's happening in the state of Israel. In Israel, is your involvement also as intense as we see it on this side of the ocean? Well, there are a lot more commentators here talking about Israel <laughs> in Hebrew than they are talking about it in English. Uh, but I'm frequently on the Israeli news. Um, I was on the news yesterday uh, talking about the Iran nuclear deal. Um, I'll be usually about American issues. Unfortunately, I've been kind of pigeonholed as the, the Mr. America here, uh, explaining America, which is not so easy explaining America. It is not. Um, uh, it's actually harder explaining American to, America to Israelis than it is explaining is Israel to Americans, believe it or not. Uh, and, uh, and I do write columns and I, do, um, and I, and I engage in political uh, consultants. I, I consult um, or I offer advice to various Israeli political figures. And to go to those other topics, to the Iran deal, is it something that has risen to the level of the concern we had in America during the Obama administration? Do you see the Biden administration taking it to that same approach? Or well, it's not, ideal, it's not as ideological uh, as it was during the Obama administration. The Obama administration that was part of a policy of reorienting American policy in the Middle East away from uh, America's traditional uh, Israeli and Sunni Arab allies and, and sort of repositioning America vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Um, and so that was, it was a, a much broader uh, danger. But you know, we have to keep in mind that, that President Biden and his advisors, and I, I know them all quite well personally, um, at the end of the day, they are Democrats. Uh, they, are, um, you know, they are influenced by the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, which has elevated uh, the Iran nuclear deal to something of a holy grail status. No one even knows what's in the agreement anymore. And if you read an article that I wrote with, uh, with Yossi Klein Levy about two months ago in the Atlantic, we gave the Israeli position on the JCPOA, if you're, if it, if you're ever scratching your head. And one of the reasons that, one of the ways that the Obama administration was able to claim that the JCPOA blocks Iran's path to the bomb, something which it, it emphatically does not do. It's just not true. It, it actually paves Iran's path to the bomb. Uh, one of the reasons they were able to claim it is because the, the agreement is so complex technically. So what this what this article does is unpacks it so that anybody can understand why Israel views not Iran's violation of the deal as strategic danger, but Iran's adherence to the deal as a strategic danger. And I will conclude with this. Um, if the JCPOA is renewed, and I believe it will be unless something untoward happens, uh, we will then be on the path to war. And the war will be Israel with its new allies in the Middle East or Israel on its own? Well, Israel has to defend itself by itself at the end of the day. And we're happy to get help, but uh, we have to defend it by ourselves with our capabilities. But the JCPOA, uh, as I said, paths, pays the path to the bomb. Iran eventually, the, the terms of the agreement will unravel. The sanctions 
uh, the limitations will be lifted. Iran will be able to uh, do all of that it's doing now illegally and 10 times more, but legally <laughs> under the JCPOA. And, and in addition, the JCPOA does nothing to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear warhead. It actually in, advances Iran's missile program. So you're going to have uranium, you're going to have a warhead, and you're going to have a missile to deliver it. And when we try to stop it, Rabbi, Iran will have taken the hundreds of billions of dollars that it gets from this deal and invested in missiles. It will fire those missiles at us from every direction, from Syria, from Iraq, from Yemen, from Gaza. And we'll be facing a very, very difficult strategic. I will win. We will prevail because this is the Jewish state. And I believe we're here for a purpose, but um, it'll be very rough. And why the United States is doing this is an utter mystery to me. No, it's when Israelis ask you why the Americans are doing this, it is, you don't have an answer for them or? I do, I do. It's, it's an analytic answer. One is that I talk about the Democratic Party, what's gone on there in terms of the progressives. who are very quiet and small under Obama, but they're not quiet and small anymore. And they're not afraid of Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. And so they're putting tremendous pressure on this administration to renew the JCPOA pretty much at any cost. And in addition, there's only one really effective negotiating strategy for the United States, and that's by having a viable military option. But that's not going to exist today. There is no viable military option. The United States is not going to project significant military power anywhere in the world today, anywhere. Certainly not in the Middle East. So that, you know, that having those two factors, you, you've got to, you, you're pretty much on the path to seeing this agreement renewed. And Israel's going to have to, you know, take a deep breath and tighten its belt and say, okay, what are we going to do now? And with the turmoil in Israel and Israeli politics, is is Israel geared up to, if God forbid, they need to take that kind of chance, to take that kind of stance to take it? We're fifth I'm, I'm, cons I'm concerned about it. I'm concerned about it. Because, you know, our prime minister is not the commander in chief. Our government is the commander in chief, collectively. And right now, in the absence of a viable coalition government, that becomes very problematic. Do you see a fifth election on the horizon in the near future? Or here's here's you know I always say you know as an historian I have enough problems predicting the past. Uh, it, I don't know. Uh, my gut feeling tells me that could well happen. Uh, much will depend on the decision made by Natalie Bennett. So Bennett really has risen to kingmaker status in some ways. Yeah, with with six or seven seats. It's unclear whether he has six or seven seats tonight. So it's not very much. Very small party. But it's positioned in such a way that he's the kingmaker. He is indeed. And, and he has to decide whether he's going to join a coalition with centrist and leftist parties, even Arab parties, and so forfeit much of his you know, right-wing religious base. And in terms of American jury in all of this, we seem to be split like never before. At the last APEC conference more than a year ago, mm -hmm. uh, it sounded like APEC was, was no longer the prized possession of American Jewry, but becoming more segmented and the and the opposition to it was growing. Do you well that's that's true across the American political spectrum. And I would go as far as to say, Rabbi, it's actually it's true of the world political spectrum. Fragmentation is 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 the is the is the logo of the day. It's happening in Israel, it's happening throughout the Middle East, it's happening in Europe. Look what's happening with the EU and, and Brexit and, and people things are breaking down. Institutions are breaking down. This is a, a product of you know the 24 seven media cycle, it's a product of many things, um, of, of disappointment and frustration, looking for simple solutions in, a, in an ever, in a deeply and increasingly complex world. Um, it, many factors are at play here, but fragmentation is the order of the day. So one of the great concerns we have in America is the waning support of Israel among the millennials, among those who are growing up at this point in time. You remember, and I remember, the wars, the existential wars, maybe not before we were born, but I remember the Six Day War and I remember the Yom Kippur War. Very, the Yom Kippur War very clearly. I was in high school at the time. What do we do? What, what, have, what is the, the, the strategy to engage the next generation of American jury, of diaspora jury, in the story that you became so integral to? It's not, you know, there's, there's, it's not, um, it's not rocket science. 
what the answer is. The answer is, is, is two-pronged and really simple. On one hand, it's, it's Jewish education. And the other hand is bringing young people to Israel and seeing it, what its reality is, not what they're hearing in, in school, what they're hearing from some of the, you know, from the media. Uh, it's different. There's, there's actually, that, that is, it's that simple. That's very costly. Unfortunately, it is costly, both the Jewish education part and the, the Israel visit part. I was, um, I was privileged to be Israel's representative on the birthright board um, before entering Knesset. And I, I saw how it worked behind the scenes and the impact not only on diaspora Jewish youth of a 10 day visit in Israel, but the impact on Israeli youth. And for Mar most of these Israelis, they'd never had contact with Jewish peoplehood. So they could be closer to their, you know, to the army tracker, you know, Mohammed, than they would be to their cousin Josh in Chicago. And, and it was, it, that is, had, that it is a very dramatic wake up for the Israeli kids to encounter Jewish peoplehood. So I, I think that programs like Birthright, Massa, and others, have a tremendous role here in assuring Jewish continuity and, and Jewish unity. And by taking those, bringing the kids to Israel, you know, I've seen an uptick in uh, requests from people in my community to write what we refer to as the Jewish letter, which means they're planning on making Aliyah. Uh, right. I don't know, you know, people have identified part of it was COVID, but people were reevaluating their lives. Part of it, I think, is also the cost of Jewish life in the diaspora. Is Aliyah still high on the agenda of the Israeli government? Is it something Israelis are- Oh, you just, add, you just asked the most sensitive question at all. So I think that uh, we could, we are in the position to absorb uh, far greater numbers of Olim, uh, both from Europe and from the United States in the coming year. People who were sitting on the fence, you know, several years ago are no longer sitting on the fence. And those who were, who never would have contemplated sitting on the fence are now sitting on the fence. And, and there are many factors involved in it. COVID is one of them. Um, the challenges to American meritocracy is another. The Jews were the great beneficiaries of American meritocracy. Um, Anti-Semitism, many factors involved in this. Um, and Israel is looking increasingly attractive. The big question is the one you raised. Does Israel want them? And I, it's a question that I asked when I was in Knesset. It's a question I've asked since I've been out of, question, out of Knesset. I live in a French neighborhood. Uh, and I know that the significant majority of French Jews did not come here. They came, they went to England, they went to Canada, they went to New York. And to me, it's a, a great missed opportunity, historical missed opportunity. And the question is, does, do Israelis think, okay, we have enough Jews here? And many, I know many, many who would surprise you uh, believe that and, you know, don't want the headache of all these Olim. And, uh, and yet they lose sight of the self-definition of this country. We have defined ourselves by law as the nation state of the Jewish people. And as the nation state of the Jewish people, we are duty bound, we are, we are history bound, okay? We are history bound to fulfill that role, which means actively embracing all those who choose to move here. And the government will does take those positions because is Israel is also very good at red tape. Um, it is indeed. Ask the French here. Uh, the question, you know, in previous governments, the 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 machinery of Aliyah absorption have been the hands of the Russians. <laughs> now <laughs> the recent government's in the hands of Ethiopians, and they're all saying, "Okay, you know, this is our turn. We we are now going to take these resources." So it's sometimes it's just pure politics. There are not a lot of Americans here, not a lot of French here, and the Americans who are here do not vote on bloc. They do not. Uh, we've tried. And, uh, and so they don't, they, they punch far below their, below their numerical weight. Uh, the same is true of the French. The French right now vote for Netanyahu. But if Netanyahu were to go, the French vote is up for grabs. Which is why, which is why I'm studying French every day. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah. So it's really, it, 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 history is still being made. When you spoke about coming into a backwater country in 1979, yeah. As much as Israel is cutting edge, it's changing faster than most other countries are changing. It's more exciting in so many ways than most other countries. Uh, Last year, um, uh, foreign investment in technology went down about 30% worldwide. Here it went up 35%. Um, Israel is now investing in foreign technologies. Who would have thought? What Herzl would have thought that someday Israel would be exporting capital. And um, that's extraordinary. But, and there's a big but, that 
blossoming, that flourishing of Israeli technology and, and economy is only impacting a relatively small part of the population. And after the United States, Mexico, and Chile, Israel has the largest uh, income gap of any country in the world. And from my perspective, for a Jewish state, that's, that's, uh, that is intolerable. And that income gap then has all of its political ramifications and social ramifications as well. And it, it does. I mean, there are parts of the economy which are very surprising. For example, um, Arab Israelis have a, a higher and swifter mo so, uh, social mobility than Israeli Jews. Uh, Israeli Christian Arabs are per capita better educated and more affluent than Israeli Jews. Wow. Um, it, it, it's very surprising statistics. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, it, 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 it's, it, there are parts of the population, particularly in the, what they call the periphery, outside of the, the big cities, which are very poor. We have traditional populations, whether it be Bedouin or Haridim, who generally fall beneath the poverty line, about a million children beneath the poverty line. Here. And, the, that, and that, as you said, is something that's unconscionable as a Jewish nation founded on, on, on chesed and caring for those who are impoverished and in need. And it's something I encourage yeah. on the agenda of future administrations. Please, God, when stability comes to government. Yes. You know, we have to work on it. And one of the, the coalition of anti bb parties are saying we won't discuss, uh, you know, strategic issues, political issues. We'll only talk about social issues, which is fine. There's but enough to discuss there. Ambassador, I, our time is up. And I just want to. Oh, thank we're you. just starting. We're just warming up. Well, I'm happy to come back again. <laughs> I, haven't talked about, I haven't talked about the Jewish component of writing, which is one of my favorite stuff. Oh, but it's wow. in the introduction. Well, I read why, it. Why writing short stories and, and novels is Jewish. Right. But <laughs> we also talked about the story, go even talking about the telling of the story of Pesach, the Exodus. And it is, this is, I now am able to introduce you the next time we have an opportunity to speak or interact as mm -hmm. grandfather, writer, and also a, a personality of Jewish history, Michael Oren. So I thank you so very much for this fascinating time. I have to put one more plug in for Stephanie because she Please. makes it possible. She's she the best. Always. She and, and Shlomo are the best. So I will, Well, they now have it in, uh, on, on video. No question about it. <laughs> they are the deep. I look And I look forward to seeing you soon in Israel. Please, God, will be there soon. And thank you for everything you do, for all of Klal Yisrael and for Medinat Yisrael. And thank you. Tada. 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 Tada